Hello, and welcome to the 2019 CIO virtual event, Cloud Computing Security Risks, what you need to know to effectively protect your information. My name is Maria Antwort with Argyle Executive Forum, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have a few administrative details to share with you, and then I will turn things over to our esteemed speakers. First, we would like to thank Prisma by, by Palo Alto Networks for their partnership with today's event. They've been a wonderful thought leadership partner to Argyle, and are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. So thank you again to Prisma by Palo Alto Networks. We appreciate you joining us today. We welcome you to stay connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please use the hashtag ArgyleExec Forum. You can also follow us on Twitter at ArgyleExec Forum, and be sure to join our LinkedIn group, CIO CISO Forum. I also wanted to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policies, which were curated based on the feedback we received over the years from our members. Argyle is very proud and protective of this policy, as it reflects our commitment to ensure the neutrality and overall value of the content presented at our events. We work closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today. We appreciate our members' support of this policy. We have one upcoming CIO leadership forum in Boston tomorrow, if that would be of interest to anyone. Finally, and most importantly, please submit any and all questions that come up during today's event into the Q&A section of the interface. Following the panel discussion, we've set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on these questions. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Keith Mokris, Technical Marketing Engineer at Palo Alto Networks. We're pleased to have Keith with us to deliver opening, opening remarks. Welcome, Keith. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm really excited um, you know, to be a part of this presentation and also looking forward to our panel discussion uh, to follow today. And today we're going to be talking about security in a cloud-native world, how organizations can evolve security to protect their workloads and applications in this new landscape. One of the things I want to highlight is that we see cloud native adoption continuing to grow across the enterprise. Um, one of the things that we see is that cloud is really driving application modernization. Um, so stats show that eight out of 10 enterprise apps today are cloud enabled or cloud native. Um, we also see that a big part of this application modernization really involves containers. Um, and depending on the statistic you choose, I think one in two enterprises using containers by 2020 uh, is really kind of the benchmark for how widespread this container adoption is. And then as you look you know, across the cloud native continuum, organizations are also looking at event-driven computing and serverless offerings. And statistics show that two in 10 enterprises will embrace serverless over the next 12 or so months. And at the same time, um, this really creates a challenge for enterprises. Um, software is certainly eating the world, um, and our panelists today will provide their perspective on this as well. Um, almost every organization across industries is becoming a software company. Um, and this is really built around this notion of improving reliability, speed to delivery, and ultimately business value in a competitive market landscape. And ultimately, this app modernization really requires a need for a modern toolkit. And so things like um, development operations, both teams and tooling, platforms that use containers, and other cloud-native frameworks become a core part of this modern toolkit. And at the same time, as software eats the world, we have to be reminded that the world is dangerous. And this isn't about um, scaring anyone when it comes to app modernization or using cloud-native tooling. It's just recognizing that attackers and threats are available, and even insecure software or platforms can really present challenges for enterprise security teams. So there's the democratization of sophisticated attacks, where a lot of attackers may have access to automated attack tooling. Um, security teams and SOC teams are overloaded, um, both with alerts or both with just challenges and processes. 
and ultimately all the software and configurations that enterprises are responsible for can often be the softest target for an attack or compromise. And when we think of cloud native applications, we can broadly think of three key layers. Um, on the bottom, we have the physical layer, the buildings, metal, and silicon, and servers that organizations are responsible um, for running their compute on. We have all of the services that organizations are using, essentially the off-the-shelf databases and app servers that are available. And then finally, there's the actual workloads and applications themselves, essentially the compute layer, the software you're responsible for building and deploying. And ultimately, today's enterprises have a wide range of compute options. And each of these options prevents different opportunities and configurations based on how the organization wants to configure and deploy their workloads. Um, on the left, we have virtual machines, which provide a lot of op uh, isolation, um, as well as a lot of control over how they're managed. And organizations have really shifted to be able to deploy VMs um, in the cloud as cattle rather than pets. So essentially, you can redeploy these really quickly instead of you know, maintaining them with unique names and nursing them back to health. You can use the cloud provider tooling um, to essentially deploy these in a very scalable fashion as cattle. Um, as we move from left to right, containers really enable organizations to build and deploy quickly um, with a notion of enabling microservice, uh, microservice application development. And this really starts to change the threat landscape because you ultimately have a lot more entities to keep track of and secure. Um, and then, obviously, organizations have to orchestrate all of their containers. So that's where containers as a service offering using managed Kubernetes really becomes an opportunity to improve scale at the organization. One of the things you'll notice as we shift from left to right is that management for some of these um, capability starts to shift to the cloud provider itself, where maybe you're managing um, part of the application or part of the stack, but not the entirety of the stack. And so looking at that threat landscape is uh, incredibly important. And that's definitely true when we look at the right side of the continuum, looking at event-driven container deployments that we call on-demand containers or serverless functions where you're running a snippet of code in the cloud in a very event-driven way. And so as you look at this continuum, oftentimes organizations are embracing a combination of all of these services, which each comes with a different requirement from a security perspective. And in a lot of ways, this is what makes cloud native a lot harder. If you think about your cloud native infrastructure, it includes a lot of abstraction layers especially from a networking standpoint. And so while there's a lot of benefits that come, come with cloud native, visibility and network security are certainly challenges. There's also this notion of ephemeral infrastructure where everything is constantly changing and there are also a lot more entities to secure that are constantly changing. It's not uncommon for an organization to be building multiple times a week or multiple times a day um, with a lot of continual deployments with you know, hundreds or thousands of containers that they need to keep track of. And that's where uh, the developer plays a vital role in security. Um, so it can be a real challenge for the security team to work with development and DevOps to make sure that deployments are secure. And that's where portability really comes into play, both across the life cycle and across different production environments. At the same time, there are also opportunities to make security easier in this new paradigm. And so the nature of cloud native applications allows for this new approach to security, really because of the attributes that cloud native applications provide. Um, so while we talked about some of the challenges, um, ultimately cloud native applications are inherently declarative. Um, we know exactly what they're going to do when you go to build and deploy them. Um, they're also minimalistic, and this comes with the notion of kind of the microservice definition. Um, you know, they can be run with just a snippet of code or just a few lines of code. And ultimately, if we can implement security that's more automated and efficient, we also have the ability to be more app-aware 
And also, we can implement security before applications are just deployed to production. And so this is one of the big opportunities that we see across the cloud native ecosystem. When we talk about the compute layer, it's really just one of the core layers that makes up this cloud native ecosystem. And so one of the things that we see from a challenge standpoint is there's a high interdependence and shared risk but ultimately, based on some of the tooling organizations are using, they can be challenged to um, gain visibility and understanding of how applications are running. And because there's a lot of shared components when it comes to build and deploying cloud-native applications, there can be a lot of shared risk, and it can be very difficult to prioritize that risk across all the different layers of the stack. And all of these abstractions really make it a challenge for a single human or team of humans to understand all of this interdependence at scale. And so this really sets the groundwork for implementing tools that provide automation and scale and real-time visibility for this cloud-native stack. One of the things that we like to remind organizations is that there's really a shared responsibility model when it comes to running your organizations um, on cloud and cloud-native tooling. And so certainly the cloud providers have their data centers and services that they need to worry about. But at the same time, there are challenges that every organization needs to implement um, and adapt to. So one, um, the configurations of all of these cloud services are still your responsibility. And so how you configure all of these diverse services um, is really important. And then there's the compute layer, all of the applications and workloads that you run on them. And so the two real problems that we see uniting are this notion of the workload and compute layer and then the cloud configuration layer at the same time. And so these are some of the core requirements that we recommend to any organization as they're embracing cloud-native applications. So one, security throughout the development lifecycle is paramount. Because organizations have so many entities to secure, it becomes very difficult to only hand um, an application over to the security team and tell the security team, hey, this deployment's going to happen right now. You need to secure this application. We really see this integrated look where you can embed security visibility and guardrails into CI and CD workflows and deployments um, being really important. Um, developers might not always build containers or cloud-native apps with security in mind, so it's really security's responsibility to engage developers and DevOps teams on the security requirements, both around how they configure services and how they deploy applications. And then ultimately, there needs to be a comprehensive set of capabilities across each layer of the cloud. While the cloud provider is going to take care of their data center, servers, and services, all of the configurations that you're responsible for are really paramount. Making sure that everything is API-driven is certainly an essential requirement, which is going to help organizations at scale. And ultimately, every security tool needs to be app aware. So not just looking at how you've configured um, an underlying uh, host resource, but what, what actual code are you running on all of these services? How is the application running? And how secure is the application um, at runtime? Ultimately, if we can align security with this definition of cloud native, we find that organizations can have a lot of success. I talked on the last slide about what integrated security across the life cycle looks like. Um, but ultimately, organizations really can successfully embrace the modern tooling that their development and DevOps teams want to use. And if security can implement those checks and guardrails across the life cycle, they're going to achieve a lot of success in this new world. Ensuring that everything is accessible via APIs is another common requirement. Um, because APIs are the backbone of cloud-native infrastructure, um, any cloud-native security platform needs to be fully accessible via APIs. And data portability and visibility is such a powerful requirement um, in the cloud 
that making sure that your data can flow exactly where you want it um, is incredibly important from a security perspective. And then finally, security needs to be as portable um, as the workloads and applications are. And there really aren't excuses there. Um, organizations, because their developers and deployments can happen so quickly, they really need to understand that security can't have any gaps. And so looking at it from a full stack and full life cycle perspective across all the different options in the continuum is really vital. And finally, I'll kind of close with this notion of how we can secure the new cloud native world. Um, in the old world, some of the challenges that we had were that we only secured applications or workloads in production. There were often a lot of silos when it came to how we configured compute and services. And ultimately, a lot of things were perimeter focused and manually operated. And all of this changes in this new world of cloud native security. Here, we can implement security throughout the application lifecycle. And then we can also make sure it's integrated um, across all of your applications and underlying resources. And if we can essentially gain more visibility and focus on each individual application, we believe organizations can have a lot of success. And ultimately, this is where we can shift from that notion of manual operation to automation and API enabled to protect these workloads at scale. Um, and this is where, you know, I'm excited to kind of close out my presentation today. I want to thank everyone who's joined so far. And ultimately, I'm really excited, excited to be joined by our panelists for the rest of today's program. Thank you, Keith. As a reminder to our listeners, please submit any questions you have in the q and interface on following the panel discussion. We have the time for our speakers to weigh in on these questions. We'll now kick off our panel discussion titled Cloud Computing Security Risk what you need to know to effectively protect your information. I have the pleasure of introducing our esteemed panelists. And Frank, would you introduce yourself first, please? I'm Frank Kineshny. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the Air Force, uh, involved with all IT across the Air Force. Thank you. And Andre? Andre Morochko, I'm IT Senior Director for Lean Initiatives within GE Power, being very close to both our manufacturing and transactional lean efforts and enabling them from IT perspective. Thank you. And Bogdan? Uh, Bogdan Opria, I'm the SVP and CIO for Agency Insurance Company. We are an insurance uh, company focused on commercial and uh, automotive in the Middle Atlantic area of US. Thank you. Over to you, Keith. Awesome. Thank you to everyone who's joined. I'm really excited by the questions that we have today. Um, I'm excited to lead um, with a question for Frank and then invite our other panelists to weigh in as well. And so the first question is, in the cloud, um, developers and DevOps teams play a vital role in building and deploying secure applications. How does your organization or what other best practices do you recommend for organizations to enable security that works with developers? Thanks, Keith. I mean, as you mentioned in your talk, that you know the application owner has to understand what's going on, and we figured that we found that they did not really understand how to do a particular environment or how to set things up. So we went down a path of where we wanted to do a fast track authority to operate process, and we wanted to get to a point where we can actually do a continuous ATO process based on the RMF and NIST controls. Now to do this. We figured we had to actually set up an environment that they could actually utilize effectively. So we, so we have various DevSecOps environments that we've established to do agile programming with it. And part of this process is actually to involve the security experts and the testing experts in the entire process. So from beginning to the end, as each release comes out, they are involved in it, understand what's happening, and we expect the security people, and they do, come in and say, hey, that's not quite right, you need to do something else. But to further support this, we actually develop various test tools and tests for standard configurations as part of the process. So what comes out is as you do DevSec development, you get a list of things that have to be fixed immediately or they pass the testing. And we pass the testing in a certain way so that it maps against the NIST controls where we actually will establish a authority to operate against. Now this is you know, particular for particular environments and things, so we now have available a marketplace of specific tools that can be utilized 
in the development production environment. These are secure tools. We validated them as well as we can, and that's, therefore they'll be quite, the developer will actually use these tools as GFE equipment to actually complete their work. And to support that, we actually have a, a support personnel staff to actually assist them in the development and utilization of these tool sets. Now, we've gone down the secure container route pretty much all the way. So part of this philosophy that we're going forward with is that we are going to generate uh, containers with, with microservices in them, and that's part of the provisioning that is automatically generated from the DevSecOps environment right now. And we also have, have established a list of uh, secure containers that provide services that can be re reused as necessary, and these are secure locked containers. So we're trying to make sure that we have availability of containers as well as everything else. And further, as we go down the path, we're starting to do auto provisioning from dev to test to production in various environments and actually doing the testing in each of those environments to validate that the results that we got out of dev actually apply to the test environment as well as the production environment if there are differences between the environments. In a lot of cases, there are differences in the environments just because of the way that uh, we've configured it. And you know, the other thing that we're trying to do right now is uh, we have some small business innovation research that we're trying to insert, if you like, those PICO services, not micro, PICO services, within the containers themselves that will start monitoring uh, security issues that could available, be available in the containers and come back with you know, issues and alerts in those containers themselves instead of applying things across on the top. So they'll be embedded within them as well as we're using uh, another another project is using Kubernetes to move data around in such a way that it's almost impossible to actually anybody exfiltrate the data without understanding how this is actually managing. So we're trying to get to the point, auto provisioning, continuous provisioning of ATOs so that we can actually feel the software faster because that's been our problem all along. Because if you're in DRD, you know that it takes five years to get a project done. Well, we're trying to do this now, you know, in like five months or less, and we're trying to get to the point where we can do a, a, an ATO authority to operate within like a few days after the software hits the, hits the test site and goes to production. That's our goal. Awesome. Thank you so much, Frank. Andre and Bogdan, do you have anything to add with the same question? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, I think uh, we kind of echo the path that uh, Frank mentioned about uh, getting into micro containers and uh, going and using tools that can help you validate your security posture at the development side and then migrate from environment to environment uh, using validated uh, images of your containers and uh, technology stack. Yep. From from our perspective, um, very similar. It's the speed of business that drives these changes, and it's important to understand why we're trying to adapt to certain technologies or develop certain capabilities for for an expedited delivery of whether it's a software off the shelf or the software developed internally. Um, IT is essentially forced to adapt and uh, evolve these capabilities in order to be able to move with the speed of business. That's great. And this really leads us to our next question, which I'll um, surface to Andre first. You know, what methodologies and best practices do you recommend or see as fruitful where IT operations and security overlap in responsibilities? Mm -hmm. so to continue on, on the thought that I've started, um, IT function is uh, fundamentally um, one of the valid activities in the overall business process. So it's the change in business that, that drives the evolution of the methodologies and best practices. And um, with, um, with both the in general technology, not just IT, and society moving faster today than ever before uh, in, in the pace of change, uh, the IT function needs to do something differently. Um, if we first look at the tool set that, uh, from operational standpoint, we're adapting, it will help to see what happens in security. So from IT operations, almost everyone by now has at least tried Agile, if not entirely converted to it. And the idea behind Agile is to be able to deliver 
the solution with the incremental and regular feedback. It gives that cadence. The reason for that is, is we, we have a harder time predicting in this day and age what is it that the business truly needs. There's no way for us to outline the requirements from cradle to grave for, um, for a software solution uh, when we're just starting to help the business. So as we're working through that, there are a couple other methodologies that um, we're finding really helpful. Um, design thinking is one of the components that helps to augment Agile in, in some of the initial sprints or even periodically. As, um, as it forces the team that's working on a solution to um, be more empathetic to the user, to understand the target user, to be able to um, evaluate certain user needs without them being expressly written in the document. Um, another concept that we found useful is Lean Startup, where it's, um, it's enabling the team to think critically about the assumptions that they're making and prioritize most critical assumptions to be validated early in the game when the software is being built or when the uh, software package is being adopted before some core components are in place. So what to prototype and when to prototype to clarify those assumptions. And in, uh, in my world, Lean is also important as we look through from IT lens of what do we need to automate or what do we need to build, first point is to think how it really affects the business process. What's the uh, value stream map? What is it that we're trying to change? And what is the target condition that we're trying to achieve for that specific business process? So instead of stating X number of transactions or Y number of uh, uh, megahertz or gigahertz on our processing capability, what is the business outcome that we're going for? And if the team truly understands the business outcome, they'll be able to make the right decisions on technology. But all of that makes security world crazy. Um, I'll already talk about DevSecOps for a second, and um, cloud is a huge enabler in, in terms of providing the right space, the secure space for the teams to experiment with new technologies safely with what was already mentioned. Uh, and uh, it also standardizes the enterprise architecture for those experiments to be aligned with a shared vision. So, um, to, um, to be able to establish um, a shared enterprise architecture and uh, the right pockets for the team to experiment is really the next challenge for the, for the security team, to break their silo, embed themselves in the uh, product teams, create uh, champions within the developers to not necessarily be security professionals, but have enough knowledge of when to ask the right questions will really make it successful. And um, it's scary to go into the cloud, but it's really impossible to move with speed without adopting it to the right extent. That's great. Thank you so much, Andre. Frank and Bogdan, anything to add? This is Frank. I have something to add. What we found is that yeah, we do design thinking too, but what's what's most important to us is when it's actually delivered fast enough. The the user actually looks at it and says, hey, I didn't know you could do this. Why can't you do this and extend it a little further to do some other things? And we find that feedback is most important since we've gone agile to really understand that there are more things that we could actually do fast enough. And so the process, we have a feedback process now that goes back to the developer side pretty quickly from production. I know we have this, you know, in terms of, of standard ways we're doing Agile within the development side, but we're, we're getting more inputs now from the output side from the, develop, the actual operators because we have a difference between developers and who controls the application, the application owner, and the operators who actually run the, the software. And so we're seeing that the operators are feeding us back information pretty fast now, and it's actually helping us get a better product to the operators who are actually using it. Bogdan, any final comment there? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like my uh, colleagues there said, um, we also are doing Agile. Our feedback loop is a little different, though, because uh, we are not deploying straight into production. We deploy internally for our uh, internal testers, our internal focus groups that provide us uh, feedback. So while we empower the developers to deploy, they, uh, they deploy to a lower environment, uh, and the feedback loop is a little bit shortened from, uh, from that perspective. Um, 
we do have some of our agents that can participate in uh, in that feedback uh, feedback loop, but it's not truly a production uh, production release. That's great. I appreciate everyone's perspectives. Um, you know, the next question I'll start with Logan and then share with the you know rest of our panel. Um, how do you ensure proper risk governance? when it comes to safeguarding your information at all the different layers of the cloud stack? Yeah, I mean, the way uh, I'm looking at this, I'm splitting it mainly into two components, right? Uh, one of them is compliance. We are an insurance company, a uh, highly regulated industry. So we are looking at this from a cloud provider compliance to some of the regulations that we ourselves need to comply. So think of this as, global regulations, um, you know, such as uh, our, the data center stock compliant. Um, then if you are looking at industry regulation, everybody has different uh, compliance uh, laws, legislations that they need to, to adhere to. Uh, in our case, it's obviously the ones in the insurance industries. Then if you are a government agency, you are looking to make sure your cloud provider uh, is uh, FedRAMP certified, uh, DFARS, and so on and so forth. And then also you have your uh, regional compliance uh, requirements. Think of this as GDPR for European Union uh, citizens, residents, uh, as well as various uh, localities within the United States that now they start to adopt uh, regulation similar to, to G, uh, GDPR. Uh, California just passed a law like that. Uh, uh, New York also has some uh, legislation around uh, uh, cybersecurity, uh, and uh, we see more and more adoption across uh, the U.S. So that's on the compliance side. Uh, make sure that whenever you select your uh, cloud provider, you have a discussion or you look at their certifications uh, ahead of time. Uh, most of them, they make that uh, publicly available or easy, easy obtainable um, because once you are in, uh, there is um, very hard to, to maintain that compliance level if the cloud provider does not uh, get certified at the data center level with some of those. Um, on top of that, I'm looking also from a governance perspective of the cloud security. Uh, I'm looking f uh, for what do we try to, to answer uh, with that. So uh, are we reducing our risk to acceptable level? And how do we measure that? What, uh, what tools and what metrics we have in place in order to uh, measure uh, our investments in, uh, in security technologies uh, and are we making strides into getting more more secure? Also, are we uh, are we getting the desired results out of our out of our security investments? Right, because we can always add more tools to our ecosystems, but does that actually reduce our security exposure? Uh, does that help us uh, better secure our uh, our data? And also. We need to know if uh, if these investments that we are doing are are they in line with uh, uh, with what our business needs, right? Is there a strategic alignment uh, within uh, our uh, IT offering, IT service offerings, uh, for uh, to provide services to our business units um, in order to get you know, market competitiveness, financials, operational performance. Uh, this kind, uh, this kind of stuff, right? So uh, obviously there are some challenges that you can get of this. Uh, some of them, it's uh, you need to get buy-in from the senior management uh, when uh, when you roll out your cloud program. Uh, you need to make sure you have all the operational controls embedded into your processes. Uh, you need to make sure that your operating models, your roles, your responsibilities are clearly defined. Uh, and also, but not least, make sure you have all the ma uh, metrics in order to measure the risks that, uh, that are involved uh, here. Because at the end of the day, um, the security that you add to, to your tools, uh, it's uh, 
something that's uh, uh, very critical to your business and uh, it's something that uh, you, you need to make sure you have a clear understanding of your uh, posture. That was a great answer. Thank you so much, Wimban. Um, Frank and Andre, I'm sure you'll have your perspectives as well. Anything to add? This is Frank. I'll I have a few first. things. Go ahead, Andre. Go ahead, Frank. Uh, no, you go. All right. So looking at the cloud as the capability, it actually presents an interesting new challenge. It's so easy to introduce it that unless IT can respond fast enough to the business needs, everyone's in danger of developing a shadow IT organization. And short of being in an entirely locked down environment um, where the assets are just all in the enclosed network and people leave their digital devices at the door, it's almost impossible to prevent functional teams to reach out and play with the tools themselves um, at a cost which is at a fraction of what it used to be to get a server or get an environment set up if they can't get the right response from IT. So it's, it almost becomes a, a fundamental part of the strategy. How do we enable the right secure playground for the teams to do their experiments, to um, to satisfy their curiosity, maybe even find awesome solutions that the IT strategy gurus haven't come up with in a safe and secure way. Um, that's, uh, that's another interesting challenge that comes in with the cloud and the cost that it provides to us. Okay, it's my turn, Frank. Yeah, Andre, this is, this is interesting because that's why we set up a a marketplace of tool sets that people could actually play with, if you will, to validate it. And if they need more tool sets to play, to play and see what was the best solution. Because we did want to be able to open the capability out to the field to say, hey, you know, what do you think is best? Because we can predetermine it, but we can't, you know, that's a snapshot in time. Everything changes pretty rapidly now. And so we want to move out and we said, okay, let's develop this tool set or this capability to actually get a tool in evaluate it and determine if it meets the security constraints we have as well, and then figure out if we're going to put it in production or development. Now, DoD is a little bit different. We're security conscious to death. You actually have to know that. And so we just don't go to any cloud. We go to a cloud that has been approved from FedRAMP, and further than FedRAMP, we go to even more controls from, from DISA as to what we will actually put in the cloud based on the controls that we have established as part of our uh, strategy plan, part of our requirements document that we sent out to the cloud providers. So we have special government DoD clouds that are more secure than most of them. We also get more information back from the cloud provider if there's an incident. We have to get incident response within, I forget, 10 hours or something if there's an incident in the cloud that we have to manage. And we also have a group of people called cybersecurity service providers that watch each application or sets of applications, as the case may be, to determine, if, to determine if there's an incident occurring with an application in terms of data or, or the security and take appropriate action against it. So we are very security conscious and how we want to do this, but we want to, even though we're security conscious, we want to be able to have of an environment where people can actually try out things. This is, sounds contrary to each other, but we try to do this in the test environment and in the development environment to see how it works before we actually put in production. And I said, when we put in production, we are very secure. We have to make sure that it meets all the security controls, and we do a risk management analysis of it to determine how well it actually meets it. And if the risk is too high, we don't put it in production. Awesome. Thank you all for your responses. Um, we'll go left to right with this next question. Um, and I think it's purposely open-ended so each panelist can really identify you know, their perspective. So the question I'd love to ask is, what are some of the biggest cloud computing security risks from your view at the organization you're at, both in general, for organizations you know, adopting more cloud services today? I can start. Um, so from my perspective right now, uh, the biggest security threat is uh, uh, account hijacking, credential hijacking. Uh, I think over the last few years, uh, there are lots of 
tools and capabilities that have been deployed in the data center, uh, security in layers, uh, all kinds of uh, hardware and machine learning type of tools. Uh, so now the uh, weakest link in the chain, so to speak, is, at least from my perspective, are the end users. So that's one of the key focus areas that we have within our organization. Um, uh, after that, I would say uh, insecure APIs, right? Right now we are moving towards a uh, API economy. Uh, everything tends to be an API, everything is a micro container, but uh, the APIs are the front door to your application and in most of the cases they are public uh, and you need to make sure they are properly secure, right? Use penetration testing, uh, use all kinds of other uh, best practices within the industry in order to, to secure them. Hey, this is Frank, yeah. The, uh, I agree, the APIs are a problem for us sometimes when we go down to the lowest level library, especially the open source, you keep on going down to the lowest level and you find some malware buried way down in the lowest level you know, utility that's in one of those libraries. And that's, that's one of the things we found is, is really frustrating because everybody wants to use the open source capabilities but doesn't understand that there could be something buried real deep. And again, people are the most problems we have. I mean, they make mistakes. Even you know the cloud provider people make mistakes. So you have to watch out for that all the time as to how they do it and what they want to do. And of course, ransomware you know is, is prevalent in most of the industry. Lots in the state side now, as you can hear from the news reports, that you know, it's again, it's the people issue of doing things and not understanding what's happening out in the field. So I think education is something that has to be done across the board for the user community, in our case, the operator community, to understand what's really happening and understand that when we want to put things together and feel that there are things we have to do to ensure the security, and you just can't throw things out there. That's the that's the the shadow. Of, uh, software development that people like to throw out there and say, I need this now, and I'm going to do this. However, they sometimes come out to exposures that is not correct and are very dangerous. So, yeah. Uh, absolutely. I'll build on that from a, a people perspective. Shadow IT is probably the biggest risk given how cheap and easy the technology is becoming finding a solution that someone built, um, but it's no longer under their desk on a server, it's now in the cloud to ingest some data and generate some charts, for example, to make their life a little easier without any consideration or participation from IT is, uh, is just a nightmare for everyone trying to manage the environment. So preventing it by being able to respond to the business by educating the business is key. Um, Going to cloud, the lack of expertise and over-reliance on the provider is, is always a risk. Um, we, uh, if we dive into it without fully understanding the shared security model, even if the provider is absolutely stellar and can provide all of the certifications and all of the protections needed, they're not responsible for everything. And if the team doesn't understand their responsibility, they'll miss and they'll find gaps. Um, and last one is, is the edge vulnerabilities. Uh, when we develop solutions that are not actually in the cloud, but that communicate with the cloud, whether they're talking to machines on the shop floor or they're presenting certain interfaces and some local processing on site, those can be done with less oversight and less participation because they're not as big, they're not expensive, they don't require a cloud account, um, but they present just the same risk footprint for someone hacking into one of those and then being able to explore the rest of the network or pull all the data just through that one opening. Um, those are the top three. That's great. A lot of great takeaways for our audience. Um, I'll go here with this question, go Frank, Andre, and then Bogdan. Um, you know, one of the challenges I see at a lot of organizations is that it can be a real challenge to identify key metrics to measure when it comes to current and then improving security posture. Um, what are some of the metrics that you report on or would recommend that organizations track when it comes to really making this actionable? Okay, that's Frank. The first thing we do is we map everything against the NIST controls, and so we, we monitor incidents against NIST controls. Let's put it that way. 
if we find, and we, as we do this monitoring, and we're doing monitoring for a lot of the applications now on a continuous, well, a semi-continuous basis, if we will, because we don't do it, we do it every day or every other day, we, we find that we have to know that you're at risk. I mean, a lot of times people throw applications out there and say it's, you know, when we initially did it, it was really good, and therefore we believe it's going to be good for three years. It doesn't work that way anymore, especially since we do new developments and everything else. So we're always looking for those that we have not actually put into a continuous development cycle, how we can actually look at controls that are occurring if, for instance, if the configurations change, we want to make sure that it, that it is true configuration. So we're always mapping against the NIST controls. The other thing we look at is what incidents we're getting on the network that are potentially bad, as well as what other incidents we're getting from the cloud providers. As we go th through this, we're trying to figure out, you know, how can, and you have to understand, the Air Force is a worldwide operation, so we have several clouds at each of the bases, if you will, besides the commercial, large commercial clouds. And so the shadow IT for us is, is a little bit more complex. But we, we want to make sure that anything we see on the network, we identify as accordingly as an application, and it makes sense for us to keep it there and whatever. So those are some of the security controls we try to in place as to what is actually going on and what are you trying to do. Because we can see data flowing. And I guess, you know, putting my on Andre, you know, we see a lot of data that's being analyzed at the local level that's really shadow IT per se. I mean, they got a tool and they're using it to actually do some an analytics and everything else and saying it's not an application, but at times we think it's almost an application because they're combining data together and explaining things. And it's not Excel or anything like that, but it's something more more advanced than that. And so this is one of the issues that we have all the time as to, you know, what are we actually showing, what are we actually seeing at the lower levels, and what security we have to embed into the lower levels. So we're actually working on this as to what monitoring we have to do and what what uh, the metrics of the monitoring is, is basically looking at secure hygiene across the board. We always do that, looking at what applications are actually running and how long they've been running and if there's any deviations we see within those applications and things. Similarly, and uh, Thanks, from a from a view of um, um, of the development teams and the product managers, because essentially we're evolving into an organization where every single functionality we provide to the businesses uh, is viewed as a product. Um, we're looking even at the starting point: is every product properly documented in the uh, configuration management database with all of its risk profiles, with all of the data classification, so we can enforce the right controls on that application. Um, does the application go through the appropriate secure development lifecycle with um, CI, CD, and uh, scanning for, for the code? whether this is a recurrent scanning because new vulnerabilities come up even if the code is not touched for multiple years. Um, that's another metric. And the, the last one uh, that I will mention is the um, training of the uh, developers. Do they have the basic security training, who is certified in which security aspects or in which cloud aspects, and how many people on the team are supposed to have one certification or another so that the team has a holistic view of all possible um, things that they might miss otherwise without having that knowledge. Uh, we have something similar. We actually engage with an external third party on a quarterly basis. Um, they run against us a scoreboard, around 54 uh, metrics that they are measuring within our organization. And our goal is to keep improving on uh, on all of those. Uh, the scoreboard is mainly based on the NIST recommendations. So we are evaluating everything from our active directory to our development practices to uh, how data is stored. Uh, is there any data drift around, uh, around our system? So we go through all that process, and uh, we need to report that uh, to our um, auditors uh, on a yearly basis anyway. So uh, we are... Uh, we are doing that for both purposes, I guess. Thank you all for your great answers. Um, I think we might have time, you know, for my seat to ask one more question. Um, you know, as we get 
close to ending today's program. Um, but as you look forward at your organization, really from kind of a process standpoint, how do you hope to continue remaining agile as you know technology evolves and security methods and tools need to meet these new demands? How can organizations um, you know stay agile in their own approaches um, as you know this world continues to evolve? This rank, I'll go first. <laughs> the uh, I think you have to have an appropriate governance viewpoint of what we really want to get out of you know doing all this. I mean, we now are doing you know AI particular training exercises and trying to embed AI into our applications now and everything else as a new technology. And so we're always looking at how we can embed new technologies into the development cycle. And I think that's it's it's important that the educational process and you know, some experiments are done to support that. Because that's what we're trying to do. We take particular use cases and look forward to saying what can be done. After that, it's, it gets difficult as to, you know, how can I make sure that I have the right tool sets in our marketplace? Well, we're trying to do that, you know, all the time based upon user needs and requirements. But, but you don't want to get too many tool sets in your marketplace. You want to make sure that they are secure enough and make, make sense because what will happen is you'll duplicate tool sets and that that's causes particular problems when you're trying to do uh, continuations across the various enterprise. So we, we are looking at various ways of doing it, but I think education is probably the best one of how, to, and the viewpoint that we want to take is that we want to modernize, we want to go to a digital Air Force per se, and that's probably the only way we're going to get there, and that's the push right now. How much digital can we do? How much mobility can we actually include? How effective are we? We're going to go to, you know, next 5G capabilities across the board. I, I'll follow Keith on, um, on that topic. The technology keeps changing all the time. We've got Industry 4.0, Internet of Things, mobility, um, AI, wearable devices. Um, that will continue. And um, things that will come in our purview and become part of our tool set in the next even two to three years, let alone five to ten, uh, is going to probably blow our mind. What's important is to prepare the team with the right capabilities. Are they able to identify the right technology for adoption? Do we have uh, a process for the team to safely play with that technology to understand what it can do so they can evaluate it for the right business purpose? Are we breaking down the silos between developers, operations, and security to form true DevSecOps product teams? that can act independently and have the holistic knowledge of what they're doing. If we set the team with the right capabilities, they'll be able to adapt to the flowing of new technologies. If we simply focus on adapting one technology at a time, eventually the, the pace of change is going to become unbearable. Yeah, and just to add uh, to this, I'm a big proponent of uh, technology with a purpose, right? So when we are looking at evaluating new technologies, I always challenge my team to uh, answer why and how will this improve our uh, business outcome as well as our security posture, right? And if it's the right tool for the right job, uh, then we can uh, look further into it. But otherwise, um, to echo uh, my fellow panelists here, there is lots of technologies that's going to come, lots of technologies that's going to go. Uh, the question is, which one are we looking to adopt and for what reasons and what are the risks associated with it? Awesome. Um, you know, before I hand things over, I just want to say a huge thank you, you know, to our three panelists today uh, you know, for answering so many questions and providing such awesome guidance you know, to our audience today. Um, and with, this, with that, I'll hand this over to Maria. Thank you to the panelists and Keith for doing a great job moderating. We're now going to review some of the questions that were submitted by the audience during the discussion. The first question is, when moving from on-prem to cloud to lift and shift, for speed, what would be the top three things we should ensure we are implementing from a security standpoint? Anyone want to take a lead on that? 
This is this is Frank. I'll I'll try this one. Uh, lift and shift has always been a problem, <laughs> so uh, especially for us because we find we can't really do it. So if you're trying to do lift and shift, you have to understand there's going to be some issues with performance possibly and when vulnerabilities that you have built into the code. So I basically say the first one of the first things you have to do is look at the current tool set that you're using to determine how compatible it is. And if it's not compatible, you probably have some going to get some exceptions that will cause you to have a vulnerability. So that's one of the things you need to do right off the bat. And it should determine, uh, based upon that, what do you think for the database side especially, because a lot of times the database is the weak side, how are you going to manage the database side and if you're going to be, how are you going to manage the, the authentication authorization side when you actually move, lift, and shift it to the cloud? Do you have a different security model than what's normally in the cloud and the structure? And again, as you move things to the cloud, you have to, we've all talked about this, is that you have to realize that the cloud provider provides you something. It does not provide you security for your application per se. It does not provide you a secure data storage area per se. You have to work to actually do that. You have to change your passwords and everything else. You have to put up whatever security tool sets you need to do to manage that application. And I think you need to consider that when you're doing to lift and shift. Because lift and shift is always a little bit dangerous because you're using technology that is currently probably out of date and may not be totally compatible with the uh, the tool with the, the cloud provider. Thank you, Frank. I'll go next. Um, to build on top of that, I think the identity and authentication is, is definitely the key as you work through the integration of the lift and shift into the probably some kind of uh, authentication through the cloud technology back to the enterprise methods. Um, it's important to understand exactly how it works so there's no hijacking in there. Um, the second um, item I wanted to add is network. There'll be a lot of flows back and forth. There'll be many ports that need to be open. And um, um, Frank mentioned about the environment, the way he looks at it uh, in a few previous answers. Monitoring those network flows and understanding what's heading where and being able to detect early if something is not moving along with expected path um, will, will help you identify any of the gaps and holes in the security early enough as you do lift and shift. Yeah, and I would add also uh, data encryption, both at rest and in transit, right? So you need to understand how your data is going to be stored and how the data is going to move across your network or across uh, the public internet for uh, for that matter, right? Because uh, it's uh, now you are working on somebody else's network and you need to see what kind of encryption you need. Well, some cloud providers already uh, give you the option with one click to enable encryption at rest. Uh, at the end of the day, those keys are still stored within the cloud provider. So do you trust that or you need to get an extra level of uh, encryption on top of uh, the default encryption? Thank you. The second question is, what do you see as emerging trends in data security for 2020? Does something immediately come to mind? Yeah, this is Frank. The, uh, I mean, we're looking at, it, as I said, as an innovation uh, project, we're looking at what services can we embed with within the containers themselves that will support some of the uh, security, uh, if you will, uh, look at, looking at what's going on in the container itself to determine if there's something that's wrong and missing. So we're trying to actually determine what a container would look like I mean, a lot of the stuff we're getting right now is basically tool sets at the endpoints that are telling us that are, there's deviations from what we believe is the common way of looking at it. We're trying to do this in a container viewpoint now as opposed to anything else to see if, the, we expe if there's a deviation from what we expect the container to be providing in top of the service, then we want to alert that and keep track of that and determine if that's really some has gotten into the container, which is somewhat difficult, but it's still possible that people are involved in this. And if there's any way we can mitigate, mitigate any risk with that, uh, I see lots of movement in the tooling uh, around uh, artificial intelligence and uh, monitoring uh, 
a normal traffic patterns within your network and within your data access patterns, right? So you see more and more tools coming out uh, that are more behavioral based, either application based or user based. Uh, so there is lots of uh, lots of activities, lots of new startups out there that can uh, look at this from a AI machine learning type of perspective. I, I agree. That's one of the big ones. Um, I'll just wrap up with one. We're seeing a growing expertise and transition to cloud of threat actors as well, just as the businesses are looking at the transitions to the cloud. And, and what that means is um, the attacks are going to become different. The attacks are going to become focused on specific cloud services that are exposed and being able to get from one cloud service to the other, especially as we move towards more of managed, managed services solutions. That's going to be an interesting game, yet another round of, of trying to stay ahead of the threat actors. Thank you. The next question is, how are you automating your data security efforts? Anyone want to take the lead on that? Okay, that's right. I'll go first. <laughs> the, uh, Data security is a big deal for us. I mean, besides you know everything being encrypted and everything else, we do have authentication authorization down to a very low level of data control, and so we're trying to manage, manage that as a security model for an attribute-based access control solution space so that we are restricting access down to the lowest level we possibly can as well as monitoring that. And so if there is an illegal access, we, we look at that immediately, and it's notified to uh, the particular security service provider that we have. We're also looking at, you know, what is a, an optimal solution for moving data around in such a way that it becomes uh, either, you know, fragment the data across multiple entities or have another way of moving data such that the enemy cannot really get to that unless they know exactly where we've combined them and put them together. Looking at that as another uh, innovation capability that we can actually support in terms of a security model. So I think that's that's basically it. Of course, we, we are doing monitoring across the board. Like, you know, we all said, we all use various AI technologies and everything else that basically look at, you know, deviations that are occurring. But I, that's probably not enough for the data because a lot of times, uh, and we, you know, we're looking at, you know, how to stop exfiltration from insider threats as well. And that's one of the methodologies but I think most of the thing we're trying to do is make sure that the right people get to the data when they need it and stop anybody else. Thank you. The next question is, what are some of the biggest challenges you face in keeping your company's information secure, and how have you overcome them? I'll, I'll start this one. Uh, like I said before, uh, right now our biggest threat is account hijacking um, that uh, we are uh, trying to teach our, uh, our employees uh, better ways on how to mitigate and understand and recognize this kind of phishing attacks. Um, we do have uh, various tools where we do um, phishing campaigns on a monthly basis, uh, and we track uh, track results, uh, and we are looking to see improvement across the workforce when it comes to that. So uh, it's uh, it's all about education. It's all about understanding uh, what are the easiest attack vectors that uh, the bad actors out there can exploit against your organization, and uh, going. Uh, after those, uh, the first place. Yeah, this is Frank. Yeah, I think people are the worst. <laughs> I mean, this happens all the time. The biggest challenge is, is trying to make sure that your that the your your users actually understand. You know, when they get a request, especially in the mail, you know, phishing is really bad, and we try to prevent that too. But there's, you know, different ways of understanding it and getting the employees to actually realize that as well as the user community out there that things can happen in a bad way. And so training, 
you know, sometimes we do practice drills. We send out phony emails, you know. We try to spoof them, and they come back and say, and so we try to develop a culture that says, you know, if you get something that looks funny, really report it, and you'll be happy, rather than you clicking on it and blowing things up. So I think that's, that's one of the major factors in, you know, keeping the information secure. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to add to that, we actually have a employee recognition program at the end of the year uh, for people that uh, didn't fail our security uh, security test. Thank you. The next question is, what has happened with your data security budget the last two years? How do you see it evolve in 2020? It's, uh, I'll start, this is Andre. It's kind of hard to answer that question in specifics, but in general, IT security is probably one of the functions that's, uh, that's the last on the list when anyone is talking about uh, um, optimizations and budget reductions. Uh, it's, uh, the, it's understood within the organization that it needs to be protected, and um, ultimately it's the only thing saving us as a as an as a set of IT experts um, from potential disaster, and um, those people are working in the shadows. We never see when they're successful. Um, we will definitely see if they fail. So we need to give them all the money and all the tools that we can um, that they're asking for to be able to keep the enterprise secure. So very important for the business to have that understanding and to keep the budgets for security on a priority. And yeah, this is Frank. Yeah, security is a major thing that we do in the Air Force, so that budget is 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 not cut through <laughs> that way. Same here. The next question is: How are you currently protecting yourself from ransomware attacks? We are using multiple. Uh, backup levels, including tape off-site on a daily basis, uh, and also we are replicating our data in multiple off-site locations, which is tamper-proof. Um, so in case we uh, we get in problems, we always have, at least within 24 hours, uh, we have a copy of our data. So the uh, final question is, in what direction is data security taking organizations, and how are you being proactive when imp implementing strategies? Well, this is Frank again. Uh, yeah, we're, we're very proactive in implementing strategies. <laughs> I mean, we have to be because uh, we are continuously being attacked. So this, this is one of the things that we always try to do. So we are very proactive. And I think that's, you know, uh, the way that you really have to be. I mean, from the commercial sector, I have to be proactive, too, to a different degree, but we're defending the country, so we have to be more than that. We have to be very watchful of what's going on and understand what's going on in the environment and put up enough security uh, throughout the entire chain from the user to the actual application data to make sure that we ensure that the data is moving correctly to the right people and everything else, and we avoid, you know, incidents and attacks occurring. I'll go next. This is Andre. Um, CISO organization, of course, lives and breathes uh, implementing the strategies and uh, trying to work through uh, dispersing them through the organization so that they're followed um, as uh, whether those are policies or specific actions. Um, as um, more of a member of an IT organization that benefits from that effort, um, the job is to, um, to pay the right level of attention to the CISO team to have them in the loop on um, the initiatives that are driven by the IT operations teams that are razor focused on fulfilling business requirements, but they're counting on CISO to keep them safe. So uh, it's, um, it's about having that education and understanding within the IT team first and functional team second, and of course rewarding um, those, um, those initiatives and rewarding that understanding as well that I mentioned, not 
just from perspective of um, folks who are avoiding phishing attacks, but also product managers who are paying the right attention to security, teams that stopped some initiatives because they understood that they're inherently unsafe. So promoting that culture will help those strategies to actually become effective. And I think uh, you need to have a partnership between the IT and the security organization if they are separate, uh, because at the end of the day, you need to work uh, together in order to advance uh, advance the organization. It's uh, not necessarily the security organization driving the business or the other way around, but I think it's more of a joint effort uh, to see what's the best path forward. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this fantastic virtual event. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day.